For some time now, the thought has been ringing in my heart. Why don't you tell the members of your television audience and of your crusade audiences why they should become a Christian? Why don't you tell the people that this is an issue that they will have to confront sooner or later? That all the days of their lives, they will be facing this issue in some way. And they will face it too in their afterlife. I come to you today with this thought that to become a Christian and to live the life of a Christian is life's great imperative. It's the thing, it's the life, and it's the way. Let me share with you some thoughts why you should become a Christian. First of all, when you become a Christian and you live a Christian, you come to terms with sin in your life. You face up to sin in your life. Not merely facing up to sin that's in the world. Not merely a confrontation with the sin that exists in other lives. But you become aware of sin in your own life. Now the Bible says the Holy Ghost is faithful to convict us of sin. The Bible tells how when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost to the assembled multitude, that as he preached, they were pricked in their hearts of sin. When Saul of Tarsus was on his road to Damascus, there to persecute the Christians, the Bible tells how he was pricked in his heart, pricked of sin, and he cried out uh, in reaction, and Jesus asked him, why he was doing that and told him how hard it was to kick against the pricks. And he, he then asked, Lord, what will you have me do? When we become a Christian, we face sin in our lives. Peter said, repent for the remission of sins. There is a pattern in your life, in every life, that has not really confronted Jesus Christ repented and received new life. There is a pattern, and it's a pattern and practice of sin. It is an indulgence in sin. It is the yielding to a stronger force, a force that's evil, a force that carries in it the seeds of eternal destruction and damnation. And when one becomes a Christian, he faces up to sin and he acknowledges that the Holy Spirit is convicting him. The Holy Spirit is making him aware of his sins. Now, the Holy Spirit is faithful to do this, whether we acknowledge it or not. And we know it. We know that the Holy Spirit is convicting us because of the periods in our lives when we are uncomfortable. When we seem to to stir and twist and squirm and feel that there's no place of comfort for us. There's a pricking in our conscience. There's an uneasiness in our inner being. There are moments of fear and panic. That is the result of the Holy Spirit convicting your heart of sin. And then when you become a Christian, you come into contact with a power that the Bible calls godly sorrow. Godly sorrow for repentance, not to be repented of. That means this, that when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, and you're aware of the uneasiness and uncomfortable feeling in your heart about the condition of your life, then God presents you with a power through which you can repent, through which you can break this practice and pattern of sin. It is not enough to be convicted of sin, to be sorry for one's sins. One must be filled with godly sorrow. It is a sorrow from the Godward side, and it is a sorrow that is implanted in a divine way in your heart. And the Bible tells us that godless sorrow works 
repentance. A real repentance. The practice is broken. One may slip once in a while. He may make mistakes, and he will. But that pattern is destroyed. And that brings us to our third thought. We have a chance for a new life. Behold, all things are passed away, old things are passed away. We become a new creature. All things are become new. Paul tells us that we become a new creature. We are new. We don't think through the same old carnal mind. We don't live by the same old continued pattern of sin. We're new. We think differently because we are different. And we're different because of the grace of God in our lives. Paul says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access also into this grace wherein we now stand. We have access by Christ into grace. We are no longer living by the law of sin. We're living in the life of grace, in the unmerited favor and forgiveness of God. We're walking with God, and we have a state of grace in which we live. This grace continues to flow in us, and it checks us when we start to do wrong. We feel an instant compulsion not to do this because the grace of God is sufficient to sustain us in the crises and problems of this human existence. And then you should become a Christian because God begins to form you in the likeness and the image of his son, Jesus. The whole thing is being like Jesus. Jesus came to show us what God is like. There's a remarkable little verse in the Bible where it said, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Someone began to demonstrate the grace of God. The image of the Son of God was being uh, carried out in someone's life. And they linked them with Christ. Christian means to be a little Christ. And God conforms us to the image of his dear Son, Jesus. We want to live as Jesus lived. We want to think as he thought. We want to be as he was. All that Christ is begins to happen in you and in me. These are real reasons why you should become a Christian and that you might live a Christian life. Notice I've mentioned nothing about what denomination you're a member of or what different ritualistic practices, whether you worship in a liturgical type of a church or one that has very little liturgy. I've not talked about that because those are methods that men use in their worship. I talked about being a Christian, of being conformed to the image of Christ and of knowing Jesus. I want to be a blessing today and may God use me to help you become a Christian.